morning. Uh, thank you for joining us um, this morning for the Oregon State Board of Agriculture meeting. Today is Thursday, June 15, 2023. This is Luisa Santa Maria, Chair of the Board. This meeting is now called to order, officially. I would like to begin asking the Department of Agriculture Board Coordinator, Karna Balnes, to review a few housekeeping items for the meeting. Uh, good morning, this is Carla. I'd like to remind folks to please mute your phones or uh, computer audio during the call to prevent background noise. Uh, if you are joining the call uh, by video, we request that only board members uh, and presenters turn on your cameras during the call. Uh, and if you are joining uh, by conference call only, pre-meeting materials are posted on the ODA website at ODA Direct slash Board Agriculture. Um, or they will be posted after the meeting. And a reminder that this meeting is being recorded. All right, thank you, Carla. Um, Carla, will you please call the roll for introductions and I will begin. Luisa Santa Maria, public member, uh, OSU. Chad Allen. Chad Allen, board member. Barbara Boyer. Barbara Boyer, Chair of Water Conservation Mission. Brian Harper. Brian Harper, member of the board and farmer at Junction City. Shante Johnson uh, is not in attendance. Uh, Miguel Lopez is not in attendance. Uh, Elon Miller. Elon Miller, uh, a board member, Farmer Umqua. Eric Oram. Eric Orham, board member, farmer in Kettner, Oregon. Randy Savati. I think she's going to join a little later. Uh, Josh Zielinski. Uh, Josh Zielinski, uh, nurseryman in Salem, Oregon, board member. Dean Simonich uh, is excused. And acting director Henderson has stepped out of the room but is in attendance. Uh, again, I would like to uh, encourage people to use the sign-in sheet uh, if you are um, joining us this morning. And if you would like to sign up for public comment, there's a separate sheet in the back room for that. And if you are joining online, um, you can enter your name in the chat box if you'd like to sign up for public comment. I think we'll go around the room uh, for brief introductions this morning. So we'll start with Kelly, if you might just introduce yourself just briefly. Good morning, uh, Kelly Coach. I'm the Director of Natural Resources for the Cow Creek Band of Umquat Tribal Indians. Nathan. Nathan Jackson, uh, Senior Director of Corporate Services for the Umquat Indian Development Corporation. Rusty. Rusty Rock, Program Area Director of Food Safety and Development for the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Just Paulson, Program Area Director, Market Access and Certification. We're ready to go. Hello. Somebody in the room? Taylor Harding, Oregon Carpet Act. 
Sorry, about that. Okay, thank you, Carla. Um, just um, already, Carla told you about that we will have a um, public comment, and I want to remind uh, the the members of the board, uh, please state your name for the record before you begin any of your comments. Okay, we'll just let's start now. Uh, we have um, in the first item for today is the. Cow Creek Band of Amkua Tribe of Indians and Amkua Indian Development Corporation. I'm going to call a Kelly Co Coates, uh, the tribe's director for, of natural resources, Cow Creek Band of Amkua Tribe of Indians. And also Nathan Jackson, senior director of corporate service, Amkua Indian Development Corporation. Please. Thank you. Please go ahead and introduce yourself again and you can sure. start your presentation. Okay. Uh, maybe that's a little bit better. <laughs> I have trouble with microphones. Um, good morning. Beidou, uh, Kelly Coates Kuritka, Nahongo Dana Aite. Good day. Kelly Coates is my name and I am of the Cow Creek Umqua people. And I'm Nathan Jackson as I said earlier, I work for the business arm of the tribe, the Amqua Indian Development Corporation. We just want to start by thanking you all today for having us here um, to speak with you about our natural resources department and also about um, our business ventures as well, our agricultural operations. Um, we really appreciate your time. And I just want to say a quick hello to my OWEB, fellow OWEB board member, Barbara Boyer online. Hi, Barbara. Looking forward to seeing you in July. Good morning, Kelly. I'm sorry I'm not <laughs> see you today in person. Okay, next slide. So this is just a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. So I'll go into a little bit of our history and background of the tribe, and then we'll talk about our natural resources department and some of our land management. Next slide. So the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians is one of nine federally recognized sovereign Indian tribal governments in the state of Oregon. Our ancestral territory and area of interest is approximately 6.2 million acres and encompasses roughly the Umpqua and Rogue River basins. Um, and to kind of orient folks on this map, um, our uh, area of interest goes almost to Cottage Grove at the north, a little over the Klamath County line to the east, down to the California border on the south, and then Scottsburg and Agnes to the west. <clears throat> we have different uh, land statuses. We have fee lands and trust lands. We've got a little over 23,000 acres in trust and a little over 14,000 acres in fee for a total of 37,215 acres of lands that the tribe owns and manages in trust and fee. Next slide. The Cow Creek Umqua or Nahanku Udana people are native to southwestern Oregon and have inhabited these lands since time immemorial. Nahanku Udana have a deep connection to the land, water, and resources. And traditionally, we had abundant resources in our area, and the tribe practiced a seasonal subsistence round. And while I'm throwing out some of our native language, I just want to call attention to something that we brought for you all. Um, our language department has been working on revitalizing our native language for the last few years. And out of that, they've created some of these um, Degelma, which is our native language board books. Um, we've got colors, numbers. I think we gave you all some of the plants and animal books. So um, you can learn a little bit of our traditional language. And frankly, that's how I'm learning our language through these board books with my children. It's been very helpful. Next slide. 
Um, so this is just a timeline of some major events for the Cow Creek tribe that I just wanted to walk through. I'll start with our 1853 treaty. We do have a ratified, um, ratified signed treaty with the federal government that was signed in 1853. After that, um, we had the Rogue River Wars that broke out and the termination era where um, our people were unfortunately hunted and killed, a lot of them. Um, it was a rough time for the tribe after that. And then came the Western Oregon Indian Termination Act of 1954 that didn't really help things either. The tribe was uh, federally recognized long enough for us to be unrecognized as a tribe. And after that happened, our tribal elders fought tirelessly for many, many years, a lot of trips back to DC, putting information together to officially be re-recognized as a tribe in 1982. So we just celebrated our 40th anniversary of recognition last year. After 1982, a, a big milestone for us was in 2018 when President Trump signed the Western Oregon Tribal Fairness Act. And through this legislation, approximately 17 and a half thousand acres were returned to us. Uh, primarily BLM lands. Uh, we spoke earlier of owning over 37,000 acres of land. And apart from these Watfa lands that I just mentioned, we have purchased every stitch of land that we have. The, the reservation that was promised to us in our 1853 treaty never materialized. Um, I also have on here just the words past, present, and future. So um, when we look at things, we think about our past to help inform what we do now in our present, and then also look to the future for how we're going to manage things. So it's a pretty broad view of what's happened in the past, the resilience that we have, and then what we'll do with that resilience into the future. Next slide. Um, the Cow Creek Umpqua Tribe is a sovereign nation with its own constitution. It's governed by an elected 11 member tribal board of directors. The tribe currently has 1,946 enrolled citizens and paramount for our tribe today is our connection to our lands and our resources that have sustained our life ways. We are stewards and protectors of the land. That's how we view ourselves. And that's the approach that we take to land management. Natural resources are cultural resources to our people and practicing our traditional life ways of hunting, fishing, and gathering are part of our cultural life ways and our cultural practices. We also continue to hold ceremonies for our cultural resources. And land management, agriculture, and resource use are all 100% connected for us. Next slide. So here I have the mission of the um, Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians government office, as well as the mission for our natural resources department. So you can all see how they dovetail. Um, our mission is to protect and preserve tribal sovereignty, history, culture, and the general welfare of our membership, and serves to provide for the long-term economic needs of the tribe and its members through economic development. Our natural resources mission is to protect and enhance tribal lands, the resources on the lands, and the tribe's Aboriginal and cultural heritage to ensure that natural and cultural resources are managed in a sustainable, well-balanced manner that reflects the ecological, cultural, and economic priorities of the tribe. So as you can see, these two dovetail really nicely together. And then at UIDC, we believe and we exist to provide generational opportunities for our tribal community. And we do this by providing long-term financial stability and sustainability while being mindful of the tribe's sovereignty. And as we go to the next slide that, that shares the ODA mission and vision, the, the mission for ODA that ensures healthy natural resources, environment and economy, and, and the vision for ODA of serving the changing needs of Oregon. All of our missions, we're all pulling in the same direction. I, I think it's it's really important to understand that we all have this vision where we have to do sustainable, 
managed, responsible use of our resources, and that's how we move into the future. Next slide. So I want to give you a little bit of information about our natural resources department. Um, as I mentioned, the tribe was re-recognized in 1982, and so it took us a little bit longer to form some of our departments. So the Natural Resources Department was formed officially in 2011, and it's one of three departments <clears throat> in our Lands and Resources Division, along with our Forestry Department and our Real Estate Services Department. So we work very closely with those other two departments. Our program areas include environmental services, um, and environmental services is kind of broad. So uh, what we do there is our water quality monitoring, our wetlands work, um, other monitoring as well. We have a GIS program. We have our heritage program. That includes our tribal historic preservation office, our tribal historic preservation officer, our tribal archeologist, as well as our curation specialist. We also have a lands and wildlife program that focuses more on terrestrial wildlife. And then we have our fisheries program and we also have a tribal gardens. Next slide. So the tribe uses an integrated approach to resource management that focuses on shared goals and objectives that reflect the mission and vision of the tribe and our departments and also our tribal businesses as well. Under an integrated approach, all natural resources are cultural resources, as I mentioned before. We develop our own management plans and we have authority over our tribal lands. We have our own internal processes and procedures. We are a government, so we have to have those. <laughs> and as a result of our government to government relationship with federal and state agencies, we use consultation as a tool to communicate about natural resources, science, and our culture. And I want to talk a little bit about our integrated approach. So um, some of you may have heard um, other agencies have an interdisciplinary approach. I found that the interdisciplinary approach can often pit resource specialists against each other, uh, creating a conflict of what's more important today, timber or fish, owls or fish. We don't want to have that within our department. <clears throat> so using the integrated approach, we all come together around the table to accomplish our goals and our projects while also protecting the resources. So what we wanna come out of a meeting is a win-win for the resources, but also for any of our projects that we're doing as well. And this has been a really great model that works for us. And it's all based on the fact that we consider our natural resources, cultural resources. So if I'm doing a project and it's a salmon restoration project, I don't just think of it as a fish restoration project. I think of it as a culturally significant species that our people are tied to. And I think that perspective helps us move through this integrated process. Next slide. So land management, the Natural Resources Department manages all lands, but we do this in partnership with our other departments and tribal businesses. Um, I can't take credit for this saying, but somebody that I used to work with um, talked about having your silo of excellence and living in that silo of excellence. And it's really easy to do that. But when you do that, you can't accomplish as much and you don't have that holistic viewpoint. So we really try to get out of our silos and work cooperatively with as many partners as we can. Next slide. One of those partners is K-Bar Ranches. So K-Bar Ranches is the primary agricultural business operation of UIDC, the Umqua Indian Development Corporation. Um, we manage land in Douglas and Jackson counties. Uh, we have about 5,500 acres total. Um, 1,700 of that is in Jackson County. And th this is managed by the ranches, not, not by UIDC or the tribe writ large. Um, 1,700 acres in Jackson County, the balance of that is in Douglas County. Uh, we have about all of the farmland between the two table rocks in, in Central Point. And then here in Douglas County, our ground stretches from Winston to Days Creek. So we're, we're a little spread out up here, which, which makes farming the road a lot of fun sometimes. Um, 
generally we do a lot of hay and we have a lot of cattle. Uh, we do stalker cattle and cow calf pairs. We also lease some some of our lands out to other producers. Um, we have sugar beet production, we have sheep, we have onion seed, we have hemp, we do a little silage corn, a little bit of this, that, and the other thing. As, as we all know, you have to have multiple income streams in an ag operation in order to be sustainable and profitable. So um, talking about our South Ranch, as Nathan mentioned, um, our Rogue River Ranch operation, uh, we own quite a bit of the land between Upper and Lower Table Rocks, um, right on the Rogue River there. And this location has a lot of cultural significance to the tribe as well. Um, we have an MOU with the Bureau of Land Management and the Nature Conservancy for management of table rocks. And some of our lands actually go up onto the lower parts of table rocks. So again, when we talk about you know this integrated approach, we're always thinking about the cultural connection to things. Next slide. So healthy resources. Healthy resources are a pillar of our land management platform. Um, we do water quality monitoring on tribal lands. Um, our staff actually work a lot with water. This is our environmental services program, but you know it takes a village of our natural resources folks out there doing the work. Um, we, as part of our um, Western Oregon Tribal Fairness Act reservation lands that were restored to us, we received some lands in, um, and I should say that a lot of our lands are non-contiguous. So as Nathan said, you know, it's pretty fun working in the checkerboard sometimes. You get really, you get really close with your neighbors and you learn how to partner. Um, some of our lands are on West Fork Canyon Creek, and this is located if you're on um, I-5 and you're going north into Canyonville, it's just before Canyonville um, at the exit. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we were these lands were given to us in 2018. Um, the ink wasn't even dry on the um, on the agreement when we had the Milepost 97 fire breakout, uh, which threatened the town of Canyonville. Um, it ended up burning, I believe, around 1,300 acres of our lands that were restored to us. Some of those acres went right up through West Fork Canyon Creek, unfortunately. So. Um, we didn't even have a chance to get out and do pre-monitoring on things yet. So immediately we kicked into post-fire monitoring and recovery. Um, so we have a water quality monitoring station set up on um, West Fork Canyon Creek within those burned areas um, that we've had since basically 2019. We've also been doing extensive fishery surveys in there as well. And we were a little nervous when we got into the creek after the burn. We were unsure what we were going to find, and um, we were pleasantly surprised with the number of trout we found um, and salamanders as well, and the water quality has been pretty good up there. So um, we're also working on a project up there to do um, in-stream restoration and continue the riparian planting that our um, forestry depart has, uh, department has already started within that burned area. Um, for our water quality monitoring, we get uh, EPA funding for that. We have GAP 319 and 106 funds that we've been getting for a number of years now. And it's not only in these these forested streams that the Natural Resources Department does this water quality monitoring and, and other resource health monitoring and, and work. We do this all through our ag lands as well. Uh, we do this because we believe that healthy natural resources and thriving agricultural operations go together. If, if you don't have one, you can't have the other. Um, it's through this responsible management and use of our resources that we're able to do what we do and be as successful as we are. We, we cannot degrade our resources because then we have nothing to build from. So it, it very much is this integrated approach that Kelly spoke of earlier, where we work hand in hand to make sure that we are successful into the future. Next slide. Um, part of this, as you are all well aware of, is invasive species management <clears throat> that never seems to end. <laughs> we, uh, 
um, we're working on eradication of Patterson's Curse and Woolly Distaff Thistle. As you all know, it's an ODA priority noxious weed. Um, we've been working on this eradication for a number of years here in the Valley. Um, we work with the Douglas Soil and Water Conservation District and now the Elk Creek Watershed Council um, to eradicate this on different lands within Douglas County. Um, this is a partnership between the tribe, uh, the BLM and private landowners. So the tribe brings to the table different funding sources, including BIA invasive species funds. Um, we also have these dollars matched with Title II and then private landowner contributions. So it really is a group effort. Um, we also have uh, BIA invasive species funding that we get on an annual basis to treat Himalayan blackberry um, on a number of our properties. And we use um, different methods for controlling it depending on what is most appropriate at the site. And also what's going on at the site. You know, do we have cattle there? We work a lot on our ag lands for invasive species um, management. So um, we really work together on that to figure out the best times to do treatments and what's going to work for the sites. Um, oh, Nathan. Um, a, another method that we use for controlling these these invasives is through regular burning, especially of our hillside pasture lands. Uh, uh, we we partner with uh, the Douglas Forest Protective Association, and um, generally every fall we're burning something. We try to keep a three to four three to five year rotation on our burns so that we can keep the blackberries and the and the poison oak at a dull roar. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so restoration. So I talked a little bit about one of our stream restoration projects, but this is a prime example of how we work together with our ag operations. Um, we do a lot of stream restoration for fisheries recovery. And as you can see from the photo here, we've got a, well, actually, I don't know if you can see what's wrong with this photo, but typically your fence doesn't hang out over the creek. Um, we've had quite a bit of erosion. This is on our um, Rogue River Ranch property. Uh, our land is adjacent to a side channel of the Rogue River, and over time, this bank has been just continuously undercutting. So a few years ago, Nathan took me out to the property and said, hey, I want to show you something. What do you think about this? And I said, I think we have a problem. So we've been working together um, to address the issue, we have about 290 90 feet of active bank erosion, um, and the project as a total is going to be about 500 feet because we want to go out beyond that active erosion to avoid additional erosion into the future. And we're also rolling into this invasive species management because we've got quite a bit of blackberry out there right now that needs to get taken care of as well. This project was identified on the tribe's um, natural hazard mitigation plan as a near-term a near project that needed to get done in the near term, about five years out. Um, and because it was identified on that, we were able to get some funding through FEMA, through their um, CMP uh, grant opportunity. And then because there is a fisheries nexus here, um, we were able to get funds through NOAA NIMFS through their Pacific Coast Salmon Recovery Fund. And for this project, what we're going to do, we don't want to come in and throw a bunch of riprap in and armor the bank like that because then you're just displacing the energy that's going to hit somewhere else downstream, right? So we're going in and we're doing a um, bioengineering technique with a stair step approach and woven willow mats. And then at the toe, where we're really getting a lot of undercutting, uh, we're also going to have buried bank log jams with root wads sticking into the creek. So this becomes a fisheries restoration project as well because we're creating habitat for um, the different species that live there. Um, we've got uh, ESA listed coho in the Rogue River, and we've also seen um, fall chinook spawning downstream in the side channel as well. So this is a good project to that kind of highlights how we work together, one, to um, ensure that our agricultural infrastructure is going to be there into the future. The thing I forgot to mention is that what you can't see in this photo is we have an agricultural pond that's not that far away from where this bank is eroding, and it would not be good for either our egg lands or the Rogue River if the bank eroded entirely and took the pond with it. 
So this project really highlights how we work together um, in that integrated approach to protect our infrastructure, do the right thing for our lands, and then also help to protect fish species as well. Next slide. Sorry, so the slides here just not getting there. Oh, OK. This is Lauren, uh, Kel Kelly and Nathan. We at the board actually has copies. Oh, great. We're following along. Awesome. So I'm going to totally keep lost. going then. Thank you. Um, so the other thing that um, is really important about the tribe is we think seven generations into the future. And um, this wasn't just a slide for me to be able to put adorable photos of my children up, but I do that in most of my presentations. Um, this is a slide um, that kind of gets you thinking about why we do what we do, right? And I think a lot of us do what we do for our kids and our grandkids and the next seven generations that are coming after us. Um, we engage our tribal youth in a number of things. I've got photos here of our tribal youth reconnecting with Pacific lamprey, a culturally significant species, um, checking out the salmon that are running in the Umpqua River. Um, we're also reconnecting our youth and having them help us replant in the milepost 97 burn area as well, and helping us replant huckleberries on the Rogue River um, Siskiyou National Forest and Umpqua National Forest Divide, where fires from 2017 and 2018 decimated a very culturally significant area of huckleberries for the tribe. So the work that we do, we're always thinking into the future how this is going to impact future generations and what we're leaving behind for them. And and we're we're dedicated to providing services for our membership to help grow that strong future. Um, we recently opened our Cow Creek Food Pantry uh, here in Roseburg, where we distribute beef that we raise on our ranches down in Medford. Um, it's locally processed and and we we bring it up here and distribute it to our members free of charge. Um, that is this integrated approach that, that we take to life. Um, we don't think on a five and 10 year time horizon. You know, that's, that's kind of very typical in business. We, we don't do that. We think on generational time horizons. That's why it's important for us to manage and steward our resources because we've been here since time immemorial and we will be here forever. And with that, I just want to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions or would like additional information from either Nathan or I, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Do we have maybe a couple of minutes if someone have a question? Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Elon Miller for the record. Uh, thanks for that great presentation. I feel badly that I live here and didn't know all that you presented about the tribe. So it just makes me proud. Um, Mile Post 97 fire. Um, the approach you guys had taken with dealing with that, especially when you just had gotten the land. Um, and I, I'm thinking about BLM and their approach versus private land approach, but you're as a sovereign mm -hmm. um, nation, what your approach was. So it, like, like, snag removal those kind of things how did how did you 
are you handling that? Or is it pretty much just natural habitat focus? Yeah. Um, so we did have to go in and manage afterwards. Um, the way that we looked at it, it, like I said, we really, from a natural resources monitoring perspective, we hadn't had a chance to go out there yet. Um, we were immediately kicked into post-fire recovery and the bear process, if anyone's familiar with that, the after-fire process. And that took quite a while to get through because the lands are held in trust for us by the BIA. So we go through the federal process. And we also, because there were BLM lands adjacent to us, the BLM was a part of that process as well. So we kind of did a joint bear project after the fact. So it took a while. Um, we went in and we did manage. Um, the thing that's great about our integrated approach, though, is when we went in and we looked at the after effects of the fire, you know, I went in there and I said, there's some really great fish logs here. <laughs> is it possible for us to have some of these for our restoration project that we had already started thinking about? And our timber folks said, of course. We'll deck them for you and you can have them. So we're working in cooperation with our forestry department for some of those logs that we did have to go in and remove um, to get those for our in-stream restoration project. In addition, um, we went in and we did replanting right away. Um, they looked at areas where they could leave trees and left them if it was appropriate for wildlife habitat. And in other places where things were needed to go, they went. But then they went in and replanted with a heavy, heavy focus on the riparian areas. So really it makes it easier for us when we come in with our restoration project after the fact to see what they replanted, what things are doing well that they've replanted, and then augment that riparian area with additional native plants as needed and in cooperation with our forestry folks. So it was really an all hands on deck kind of situation and really holistically thinking about what we've got here, owls, fish, everything. Everything. Right. Thank you very much. I think in order to keep the schedule, we don't have more time for questions. So we're going to continue with our agenda. Thank you for your presentation. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I know we have the um, our members. Is we have time to talk? Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, please, Barbara. If you have a question, go ahead. <laughs> Good morning, Barbara Boyer for the record. Uh, so one thing I love about being on the OWEB board is I learned so much from Kelly and the Cow Creek tribe and all the great work that they're doing. But one of your terms was really interesting to me and I want to know a little bit more about it. Your woven willow net. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That sounds pretty fascinating and I'm just curious um, about that. And then how long of a riverbank are you using that on? Yeah, great questions. And I keep forgetting Kelly Coates for the record, sorry. Um, yeah, so they're woven willow mats and essentially it's called a bioengineering technique. And you get basically willow stakes that are fairly long and you literally weave them together into mats and then you place them into the bank. Um, and willow are an amazing stabilizer. I mean, their root system is fantastic, right, to help with erosion. And so we're going to put those in. And then on top of it, we will also do additional native planting to really stabilize things. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a woven willow mat. Um, sometimes it's a bundle of willows as well that you can plant. Um, so it'll kind of depend on what's needed at the site. And then what was your other question? Sorry. That was it. Okay. I thought there was one more. Oh, oh yeah. The length. How, how long is oh, the river bank? Yes. So we have about 290 feet of actively eroding bank. So we'll have the willow mats there, but we're really treating about 500 feet of bank because um, we want to make sure that we don't just cut it off at the active erosion. It's kind of like... Kind of like if you're sewing up a tear in a piece of clothing, right? You always go a little bit before the tear and a little bit after the tear to just buffer and bolster and make sure that everything is strengthened. So um, we'll be doing that. Plus um, out from the active erosion is also some of the invasive species management that we're gonna do as well that we folded into the project. 
Uh, Elon Miller, for just a follow up on the willow mat. So I'm trying to envision this. So yes, you're planting willows, and we in our in our riparian areas have planted willows. But then, of course, it you know if river comes up, they sometimes stay and sometimes don't. But the mat, are they actually planted, or is it just a mat and then you plant within? So um, it's going sorry. to be, <clears throat> sorry, Kelly Coates for the record. It's going to be a stair step approach. Um, so the mats will lay on top of the stair step and then um, up against it as well. So they'll be pushed in, so they'll be planted, but then we may have bunches of willow that go in there as well or other native plants that get planted within the mat too um, that help stabilize everything. And we are on, uh, we will have a monitoring plan developed for this as well. So we'll be able to go in after that first winter and see how things are doing and if we need to add some additional plants to it to shore things up, so. So, so, so if I could, uh, Lauren, um, acting director, um, that, that's a fascinating. I, I can see Barbara's wheels moving with <laughs> uh, O-Web right now and some money they may have to, to expand that, um, which is awesome. I, I just want both of you to know, and I hope you know this already, um, that on behalf of the Department of Ag, you always have a friend in us, a collaborator. I know on the invasive species particularly, and um, let's always stay connected. If, you, if we can be of help, um, please do not be afraid to reach out. We obviously are limited in resources just like the tribe is, but um, just like a question like that, we can learn from each other. And so I hope you feel that way. And if you don't, we should chat, but we'll do what we can to be a partner. And if we're missing some things, let us know. Um, but really appreciate both of you being here today. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Right. Okay, no more questions online. <laughs> All right, so I think we can continue with uh, our agenda. And the next item is um, Oregon Meat Initiative. The presenters we have today is Jess Paulson, ODA Market Access and Certification Program Director, and Rusty Rock, ODA Food Safety and Animal Health Program Director. Please, you can come to to your presentation. All right, thank you. You want to sit on the phone? Good morning. For the record, Jess Paulson, Program Director for Market Access and Certification Programs at the Oregon Department of Agriculture. And I'm Rusty Rock. Program Area Director for the Food Safety and Animal Health Programs at the Department of Ag. So um, I don't know that I can bring the level of excitement to this topic that I know that uh, Acting Director Henderson would or will. <clears throat> this has been a project dear to him and he's been quite involved in, in guiding us and how to organize uh, addressing this topic over the last really three years that we've been working with industry partners to try to find a path forward to make this not only a successful but sustainable project. <clears throat> Carl, if you could please advance to the next slide. I kind of figured to start this presentation, we would want to set the context for you in uh, why we're, we're, we're why we're doing this um, <clears throat> and kind of how that feeds into how we've designed it and how we're approaching it. So um, I've was very happy to find this map in the uh, USDA 2017 census data. I think it does a pretty good job of the intent that I was looking for and I didn't have to make it myself. Um, demonstrating how cattle and calves are uh, found across Oregon. It, it's not just an Eastern industry, it's everywhere in Oregon. It's, it's an important part of farming and agriculture. Uh, but it also does demonstrate where we do have the concentrations and where we have a lot of uh, relative importance for parts of the state as well. Um, the last bullet point there is 
uh, a little bit selective in the number of FSIS facilities. Uh, those are the facilities within the state that are uh, inspected by the federal ins inspectors at USDA. The majority of the number that we have in the state are not related to slaughter, but rather to um, value add, uh, including meat and food products. And I'm going to be careful not to intrude too much on Rusty's portion of that, but the 12 that we selected uh, on here does not include the facility at Oregon State University, which is also um, a slaughter facility. It's it's inspected by FSIS, but it's not a commercially operated uh, facility. So uh, 12 facilities under federal inspection for the number of cattle we have is, is woefully inadequate. And that's the point that I wanted to bring here. Next slide, please. Um, coupled then with the first point here being that all of our facilities are very or potentially very, very small. Um, we had a presentation at NASDA last year <clears throat> from the former head of Cargill Animal Operations <clears throat> who was describing what their model looks like for an, an operation <clears throat> and what they would consider to be large. He also described what would be medium and what would be small, and what he did describe to be small was vastly larger than anything we have in the state. Um, in fact, the, what he was describing as being small may be among the largest in our neighboring states, at least in Idaho and Washington. It's, we are very dependent on the large number of cattle that we raise in the state from moving those animals somewhere else. And um, this is something that we have had as a known problem for a long time, but really came to a head during the pandemic. Uh, we really became to recognize as facilities that are massive in volume, but have also large numbers of employees who became sick and weren't able to work, that those facilities weren't able to keep moving, and the supply chain broke down as a result. So as a state who has far more than enough animals to sustain ourselves, it didn't make a difference for the uh, people in the state to find the products that they wanted when the system wasn't working. So our goal is to improve the ability of our animals to get to processing within the state, building a local sustainable marketplace. Uh, a few of the intermediary uh, tasks that we we're looking to do is, is to improve the access for the ranchers to get to them. That could be in terms of wait times. It could be in terms of the distance they have to go to find that service. Uh, a few of the other benefits that we were identifying as we go forward is there are identified problems of getting animals into the food banks. We have... Um, some very high profile operations that had material that they wanted to donate to the food bank. And because of the hurdle of getting inspection, they weren't able to have it done in a way that um, was able to be distributed to the food bank. And that's something that we wanted to improve. We also have um, our fairs and, and the kids and the work that they go into their animals and how they sell, sell that and, and what can be done with those animals afterwards that we want to encourage for the development of future generation of agriculture. But uh, this was also another hurdle that we thought that state inspection would be able to help with. And then there's a, um, a variety of animals that we have here in the state that are, again, not intruding too much on Rusty's area, but the non-amenable not something that's um, done through inspection at the federal level that could be a part of the state system that is an improvement of service for a number of people within the state. Next slide, please. We um, started a, a industry stakeholder uh, series of meetings. We've done them either monthly or bi-monthly for almost three years now. And early in the process, we did a survey. One of the results of that survey was asking how far um, the, the res uh, respondents had to take their animals to find slaughter service. 
and uh, zero to 25 is where the, the majority is, but um, those three that follow after and the distance they have to follow is, is really a hardship. And it was highlighting the need within the state to um, in, in find a way to address food deserts, or not food deserts, but service deserts. <laughs> Next slide, please. And, and <coughs> keep being granted that the um, respondents to the survey doesn't represent the full scope of, of industry, but we felt that this did give us a, a pretty good indica indication of what this state of agriculture <coughs> ranching is in Oregon. We, we uh, selected this one because it was um, showing that while we do have a really large number of uh, bovine you know, cattle, uh, we do also have other species in there and that, that bison and elk kind of, we kind of pulled out while it's small, those are not eligible for processing through the federal system and therefore the products can't get into uh, re retail sale. It's through custom cut and, and personal use. And this is an area that we see as being as a particular in, of interest in uh, a lot of retail. There's a lot of commercial restaurant and other interest in, in some of these other species besides cattle calf. Next slide, please. So I, I think I jumped ahead a little bit with the, the impact of the pandemic, but we saw the, the big Midwest slaughter plants uh, being closed for periods of time that uh, really aren't systems that can have any pauses. Everything is just in time. Animals are being raised, they're being fed, they're being finished, they're being transported to these large facilities. They're moving through anim thousands of animals a day. <clears throat> if they shut down, those animals, they still need to be cared for. They, they, and there's more animals coming from behind. And so that flow had to go somewhere. What we found was that uh, they spread across the country looking for anything that could be used to process them and just keep the thing going. And uh, interestingly enough, we had a, a large number of hogs that were moved out into Oregon, uh, finding what was uh, our, our minimal custom cut capacity as a place to take them. And while that was great because it put product in the local market, it displaced the locals, uh, such that normally when you have an animal and you're uh, in the past able to just contact whoever it is you've always contracted with for the service a couple of months in advance and say, I have an animal that's coming up, I'd like to have an appointment. People were starting to be told, not just we won't be able to get to you for months, but in some cases, years. And that is not something you, you can do. You're raising an animal with a a timeline that you want to have that done. It was it was another one of the huge hardships and that I think brought pressure to uh, people who don't usually think about it. I mean, we do, but others don't. And that's where we got attention from the legislature. And so we received resources to try to address this. Next slide, please. I um, <clears throat> talk about this as a project, but we've actually referred to it more as an initiative. And the initiative is to look at multiple aspects of the marketplace, not just slaughter, but once the animals are slaughtered, it has to go to some form of cut and wrap to get be in the form that goes into retail or some kind of use. There has to be distribution. And then a big one that we've really um, had a hard time working around is the, the disposal of the parts that we aren't consuming. The more animals that we process here in the state, the more we have that we need to dispose of. And we haven't had a rendering plant in the state in decades. And so the cost of all of these additional materials is a hardship to the business that makes it less sustainable. It's also something that we don't want having going into <clears throat> less desirable ways of disposal, like just dumping in the landfill. That's not going to be a, a long-term solution either. So. The initiative is meant to look at all these various bottlenecks. If we open one bottleneck, what happens in the next? How do we think ahead so that we can try to be uh, addressing them in, in time and not having them creating a problem that we're trying to catch up with later? Next slide, please. 
So uh, we, we asked in our survey where people were having their problems trying to figure out in this initiative, what should we be focusing upon? And you know, the, the greatest problem is you see that 48% in the orange is on the processing side. Uh, processing, I've interpreted that in, in two different aspects of the operation. One is in slaughter and then the other was, one is in cut and wrap. Um, but then looking as, as we go further down, uh, okay, you've, you've, you've put in place a state meat inspection program. This can be sold retail rather than back to the customer that has brought the animal in as, as personal consumption. Where is that market going to be? How do we market it? How do we be successful at uh, establishing a brand or uh, something that makes it viable? And uh, so people are already thinking down the line in those terms. Next slide, please. I had a hard time trying to figure out how to break this down. So for your sake, I just put the, the terminology from the House bill in here for your reference. But the, the bill that provided us the $2 million to establish a grant was pretty broad um, in what they were trying to address and, and the leeway that we had to figure out how to use it. and. Essentially, they wanted us to figure out a way to improve capacity, which we interpreted as being providing service back to the ranchers with the intent of keeping that product within the state so that it could benefit Oregon consumers. It did require us to uh, focus on facilities that were expanding under the federal system, creating new under a state system, or expanding existing non-inspected facilities to come to under state inspection. Uh, $2 million sounds like a lot, but wouldn't be enough to build a new facility by itself, not, not of any real capacity. So we had to consider how do we spend this money in a way that is equitable, uh, especially in terms of region. Next slide, please. We had to look at other considerations, and one of the first was the the greatest hurdle that most of the people we spoke to had is a lack of access to financing. So our typical approach to these kinds of grants is one of reimbursement. We tell them what, well, they tell us what they need and what they think they need to do. We sign a contract with them, they go out and do it. And then when they've shown us that they've done it in terms of those contracts, we reimburse them the money. We didn't think that would work in this system because they can't go out and find that money already. And so we figured out a way that we could do a disbursement initially of, of the majority of the money, get them started in purchasing what they're supposed to do, uh, really have a close engagement with them throughout the process, not just turning them loose and then waiting for them to come back, but working with them through it, keeping tabs on where they are, um, trying to, between food safety and us in the Ag Development uh, Office, trying to address any issues that might come up with like permitting, working with DEQ, um, anything along the line, so that when they got that first large tranche of money spent, they would be able to come in and we'd know where they are and know that we can do that final disbursement, um, which we also set up as a final disbursement rather than reimbursement because it addresses the, the challenge we've had through the pandemic of nothing being delivered on time, contractors not being available when you need them and having a very hard and fast uh, drop dead date of the end of the fiscal year. So doing this disbursement means we've spent the money, it's out, they're able to use it and they have a longer period of time to make use of it and be um, fully operational and, and running without having to give the money back and us having essentially not achieved what we hope to with the money. Uh, we looked at ways that we could maximize and leverage the limited resources that we have by pairing it with other parts of the initiative and some of other, our other partners. Uh, we decided that we were going to focus first on slaughter. That's kind of the beginning of the process, knowing that we had other bottlenecks in the next step is cut and wrap and, and distribution, whether it's cold chains that you can store it and get it out to customers and places with it being a condition that's suitable for them or marketing and that we would have to address those with additional resources in the future or without those resources but still having to address them somehow in the future 
um, focusing on what's within the biennium and um, planning on seeking additional resources with the pop in the current biennium, the legislative session. Um, and then the, I think I already mentioned the, the look is that we wanted to make sure that this was a improvement that was happening across the state. We didn't, and we were very conscious as we were going through the applications to think about, uh, we don't want to have say three grant awardees around the Portland area and then have nothing on the east side of the state. So next slide, please. Um, in setting up the application, we wanted to uh, use the opportunity to collect information that wasn't currently available. Um, not only for us to have that baseline of understanding of where the industry is because it's not easy to track, but also so that we had some baseline to use as a metric for how the, uh, the program is performing. Uh, so if we kind of know where people estimate they are now and what they forecast that they would be able to do with the improvements they could use the funds for, we would have something to go back and evaluate. Have we been successful in doing the money? So we worked that into the application. Um, it also gave us a better sense from their responses in the applications of are we really working with uh, a concentration of cattle or to what degree are the people who are applying for this also asking for say services for alpaca or for elk, uh, for bison or uh, other animals that we know are of interest, but we don't really have a number to assign to those. So the, the table that's at the bottom there is an aggregate of all of the awardees, not of all the applicants. So the six people that we awarded estimated that they were serving almost 1,100 customers, largely ranchers, in a year, that they were um, potentially going to be able to increase the number of people that they would be able to serve from within kind of the radius of their service area by 211. So that we'd have a 35% increase in, in those that we're trying to serve. But then also looking at, you know, what does that mean in terms of the number of animals that we're processing within the state? What does that mean in terms of um, the pounds, which is maybe more relatable to what food gets to the communities within the state that we're not relying on a, a supply chain that's coming from the Midwest or for, from somewhere else. Next slide, please. I really wanted that previous slide that was talking about the region to feed into this one, but I felt like I had to get that table in there before we got to here. So th this is um, <clears throat> the business organ breakdown of the state and the colors, but um, just where the awardees, the six that we selected from are. And we, we used this map tool in our selection process. We had um, a really hard time making selections because we really had a, a good list of qualified projects. We were very fortunate actually to be having that problem. Uh, we reported back to the legislature that you, know, you gave us 2 million for this and we easily had 14 million in, in requests. And of that, at least half of it was really hard to choose from. Um, but, but in using the distribution across the state, we, we feel that we found a, a number of projects that not only represented the regionality of the state, but also the, the two different models that we were working within the, the federal inspection and the new state meat inspection program. So for half of these, they're planning on continuing with federal and the other half are coming under state inspection. Um, under the total there, how it adds up to the, the $2 million that we have, you'll notice that that's a total of our resources was distributed to the companies. ODA did not uh, hold back any money to cover our cost of operating this. We absorbed that in our existing operations so that we could maximize the money for the impact of what the money was intended for. We wanted to get every penny of this out to the recipients. Next slide, please. Kind of going through the the list of applications um, of what they had asked for. This is a, just a very rough generalization of the types of things that people were asking for for what they thought they needed to be more successful. Um, 
capital improvements and equipment are two rough buckets that we asked them to put them under. And so, um, you know, holding pens, um, if they're looking to have more animals coming in, there are certain rules they need to fall under in order to, or they need to be in compliance with in order to hold those animals. That's a pretty big investment for building up the equipment that needs to be covered by a roof, for example. Um, we were hoping to have uh, Crystal Creek, who's located here in town. Um, the holding pen is a, one, part of the investment that they're using. The money that they received is an award here to do that. So they're building up a retaining wall. They're expanding the area. They're doing a new surface. They're putting in beautiful posts and they're putting in a, a nice large roof that's going to house the animals as they're being uh, brought in. And that's going to allow them to hold more animals and then Im improve their throughput and that'll really improve both service to the customers but also their efficiency as an operation um, i think everyone had elements of sanitation uh, because coming under uh, either inspection we want them to be safe and a lot of that safety comes down to the product that people will be eating and that comes down to the sanitation and the conditions within the facility and making sure that they meet state or federal rules uh, freezer and storage space, both of them being very uh, essentially the same kind of thing, but rather expensive. You need to have installation, you need to have the elect electrical uh, setup, you need to have the actual refrigerated units themselves. Uh, it's it's a common need across agriculture, especially for distribution of perishable product. But uh, for all of these facilities, that was a common need. And then disposal. And we, we talked about the waste management and we have a couple of models that have been uh, used one here and one up in Hillsboro that uh, are kind of ahead of the others and are serving as lessons learned and, and models for people who are coming up behind them. Um, in the equipment side, you know, there's the cutter, the cutting equipment, which is just across the board. Everyone needs to have something that handles a larger capacity, but it really comes down to the um, the safety and the how difficult it is to have a relatively small person trying to do that work on a relatively or in empirical terms just a large animal and so the equipment that's available now is expensive it's large but it's you know suspended so that you're not having to hold the weight of of the the cutting device um other implements for the slaughter and wrapping um, I'm kind of passing by the value add because that was one that we struggled with. It's something that everybody needs as you're going through and you're, you're improving the throughput of the animals. You have the muscle meats, you have the, the hamburger, but you also have things that you need to do with that material in order to make it more marketable. And that comes into that value add, add sign where you're, you're mixing, you're smoking, and everyone was asking for that in conjunction with the expansion of their facilities but we couldn't often afford to do all of it at once and so those were usually the places that we were removing hoping that we'd be able to come back to that with additional resources in the future or from other other means and then the wrapping i'm going to get to in another slide here so next slide please the um Increase in production is something that I would love to come in with a, a, a strong number of uh, what we think we've achieved. But the reality is, is that we've pushed out this money. It's purchased, received, sometimes has installed. Sometimes it's waiting to be installed or it's if it has been installed, it's only been in for a shorter period of time that hasn't given us much to work with off of the numbers. Anecdotally, we know because we've been to a number of these places and we've seen what they've been able to do and they've showed us the increase in numbers, but we don't have anything to share in terms of going back to that baseline and their applications that they said they would be able to do, increase from what they estimate they do now to what they forecast they would be able to do. So maybe by the end of the year or this time next year, we'll, we'll have enough of that experience and data to, to really come back and, and share that number. Um, as a, a number of person, I'm not comfortable with not being able to share that, but we, it's just too early to be there. But rather than that, focusing on um, <clears throat> the, some of the other anecdotes that we, we've picked up from our visits with a lot of these people and that there are shorter wait times. 
I can't claim that that's as a result of the grant. The conditions of the, the national marketplaces changed at the same time, so more than likely that backlog of animals has blended back into the normal operations of the Midwest plants and other places. But we do have additional capacity in the state that is likely contributed in some part. We just don't have a way of measuring exactly what that is yet. Um, again, not treading on Rusty's toes here, but our first awardee is also the first of the slaughter places to come under state meat inspection. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. It's a person with a very good uh, vision for where he wants to go with that. It's very holistic. It's very sustainable. It's very local. Um, so their being first is really exciting to see how their success can then be replicated by others around the state. Um, at least in that case and the one here, they have their disposal systems, which is uh, preventing us from having products, say, going into the landfill and other ways that we don't want to have it being disposed of. And ideally, the one that's up in Hillsboro is going to be providing a model for creating value, not creating cost as a re result of the the disposal. He's he's put in a uh, inline containment um, for composting. It's about a two week throughput. It's under heat and pressure and temperature, um, passing down to the end of a long tube. It feeds in all the material that he is unable to dispose of or use, along with a, a carbon material, which he's located right next to a place where he can get all the wood chips he wants, which is ideal. He's finding for uh, for the um, compost, you need to keep a certain amount of air inside, so it needs to be a rough material that keeps pockets. And it's about two weeks to get to the other end. At the other end, you have this very rich material, which then he's able to do a field application within the, I think it's a 14 mile radius of where he's operating that he's drawing the animals in and then the waste material he's able to put back out to build up the forage and uh, the feedstock that he's using for the animals that he's bringing into his facility. So it's very circular, uh, very holistic and sustainable. And that's what we really are excited to see happening. Um, and then leveraging additional resources, I was really hoping to have some official announcements out by this point so I could really talk about those, but we've been working with our partners in Business Oregon and in uh, the governor's office and regional solutions to see what uh, exists outside of ODA in terms of resources and people who can assist those applicants that were awarded, but more importantly, those that weren't. And so we're, we're really looking forward to being able to announce once it's finalized how some additional resources are being brought to expand upon our effort and the $2 million that we have before we even find out if we're going to be able to get additional funding from the legislature for the next biennium. And then the last bullet point here goes back to that wrapping in the previous slide that I said I'd get to. And it's it's one of the more, um, I guess, uh, forward looking and unexpected benefits that came from this is, and that's just employee morale. Um, some of the Equipment that was put in had the anticipated benefits, improved uh, throughput, efficiency, but talking with the people in those facilities, they're going through a lot more than they've ever gone through before. But some of that stuff they had to do previously was just tedious. It was spirit breaking, just having to manually wrap in saran wrap or whatever they were using previously, all of what they did. Now they feed it into a machine and it plugs it through nice and quickly, beautifully, freeing them up to do other things. And the, the what they're getting out of their job has improved in a way that's made them happier. And when one of our greatest challenges is finding the labor to do this work, and that's something that we've not really addressed in some of the other challenges that we have there, but getting people who are trained and getting them to stay is, is among all the other challenges that we're trying to address here. So the investments in equipment that make it easier for people to do the jobs that they're doing there and to have the work that they do being something they find to be more meaningful is really improving their retention and keeping staff is 
is central for any of this to be successful. So that was a outcome that um, we hadn't really thought about going forward, but when once we saw it and heard it, we thought, wow, yes, that exactly. Why weren't we thinking about that in terms of what we were trying to get out of the, the grant? And I don't know if it's not something we weren't thinking about, but it wasn't something that we had as one of our bulleted targets. So we were very pleased with, with hearing how that was coming out. Next slide, please. Is this where I'm making the transition over to you? Yep. So you notice I, I actually recreated this seal because I didn't want to use that picture because I thought that it would be a turn off back on my map and then you went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah, that's right. Rusty. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a huge point of pride for us there. That is the uh, official state meat inspection seal. Uh, the, o the, the USDA has their circle that has uh, the, the same information in it. Uh, for the state of Oregon, we have our uh, state of Oregon outline, and that's the stamp that goes on to uh, meat products and onto the labels that are going to be used in once we have labeled packaged product, which we do currently have coming out of, well, actually, yeah, coming out of uh, our Portland processing facility. Um, so where we're at right now, uh, we've got two facilities that are actively under inspection. Uh, one is a full-scale meat slaughter facility uh, located up in the Forest Grove area that's feeding into Hillsboro. Uh, and as Jess had said, it has been a, uh, in in my mind, a raging success. They've they've accomplished all the things that they've wanted to accomplish. Um, they're already looking forward to growth of how they can get bigger. Uh, they're processing, you know, in the, the order of, I think, five animals a week, and they're selling out in their retail store pretty much immediately and have the public asking for more. So that, that's that been really exciting to see. Um, so I'm kind of getting a little out of order of my slides, but trying to run with the momentum of, of where we're at. Um, the, the path forward for us has been really, uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of of doubt that was out there, a lot of misconceptions, uh, preconceptions of what the state was trying to do. We heard a lot of, well, are you replacing the USDA? I even got a call from somebody at USDA that said, well, here's all our facilities. When are you going to take them over? And we're like, no, no, <laughs> the, that's not what our goal is. We're, we're here in collaboration and cooperation with the USDA. Um, you know, USDA's focus is on uh, the what they call the small to medium to large size facilities. Uh, the very small are often overlooked, and that's really what we're looking to try to support and grow is those very small facilities, which are still, uh, in my mind, very substantial. Uh, in fact, like with this, uh, the meeting place, they're, you know, per their website, they've got 60 employees throughout their their organization that are they're do, that are doing this so those are 60 uh, you know year-round high skill jobs uh, that it's not just at the slaughter facility that that they have added but that's their retail store and that's what you know as Jeff said it's it's all encompassing within the uh, enclosed loop so it makes it very sustainable and and has resiliency within that community because they're raising animals and they're uh, slaughtering them and then they're serving to the their customers that are in that community and it's really exciting to see so you know, focusing on that size of business to make those uh, uh, processing deserts I wouldn't call them food deserts because the food's there it's just a matter of how do we get it you know close that loop instead of having to ship it to the Midwest and then bring it back how do we keep it in the community all the time without having to uh, you know juggle that that input process that comes from the custom cutting where you have to raise an animal or buy a percentage of an animal and then you have to have the knowledge and skills to uh, store you have to give directions on what cuts and how to deal with some of the more uh, specific parts of the animal that people aren't aware of it is you know a custom animal you have you you can't just say i want a bunch of steaks because that's not what animals consist of. That's just one small part of what, what you find there. Um, 
But from the industry side, that's where we really saw the biggest set of uh, preconceptions that was was a struggle. They they had concerns related to the cost and the fees. Um, there was a lot of anecdotal information out there uh, coming under inspection uh, with the state meat inspection program and with USDA, to tell you the truth. Uh, there is no cost associated with that. The USDA provides, and as does the state meat inspection program, uh, we provide that inspection to folks uh, free of charge. So that 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 was a, a big hurdle that we've. That's probably been the thing that I address most frequently with folks that have questions about the meat program: is how much is going to cost me? It doesn't cost anything, and you know, I can't say that enough. Um, and then there was also some some preconceptions out there about, well, you know, I'm a small facility. I'm only going to come under inspection for a day a week. Uh, actually, I can't provide you with a 40-hour work week, and that, that's not required either. If you only need us there a day, uh, then we'll come out for a day. If you need us there for two hours, we'll come out for two hours. That's, that's you know, the service that we're, we're seeking to provide. Our goal is to grow it. Um, and we have challenges in trying to provide small windows of inspection, especially in some of the more remote areas. Uh, we've got a couple of facilities we've been doing outreach with in Burns, and they're planning to do two, you know, two days a week of processing. And that uh, it makes me nervous, but that's my issue to work out. It's not their issue to work out. So I've been trying to make that really clear to to folks. <laughs> Brian and his plane comes. That's right. <laughs> Um, uh, and then the other preconception that's been out there that we've heard a lot about is uh, that it's going to disrupt their business because they'll have to to stop doing their custom processing because you can't overlap a, a federal inspection or a state inspection with a custom processing operation. And that is 100% not true. Um, there does need to be some separation, but it doesn't mean you can't do the same uh, operations in the same building or even on the same day, you just need to make sure that there's a cleaning separation between them. And most of the time that's accomplished by you do your, your inspected process in the morning and then you transition into your custom in the evening if, if you need to overlap them on the same day. It's just a matter of talking through it. Um, and probably the, the biggest hurdle that folks run into, and this isn't a misconception, it is true, is that there's, uh, there's red tape in coming under inspection. And that, to me, is where we really differentiate the state meat inspection, the Oregon State Meat Inspection Program, from the the federal meat inspection or the FSIS model, is that we are uh, very much dedicated to providing that support and how to navigate the process of the red tape. So we are a partner collaborating with uh, industry, providing that outreach, again, free, um, and you know, we're We've got folks that know what the federal requirements are, so we want to you know, streamline and simplify it. We're not going to. There's no shortcuts. Everything still has to be done. Um, our program has to meet an audit under uh, the USDA FSIS audit team, so they're going to come in and make sure that we're still following all the rules. Uh, and our rules are essentially identical to theirs. We we built it that way. Um, to the point where um, I guess the other misconception is that is kind of just a perceptual issue that the uh, in, the the limitation of the state meeting program is that it's only good the, the inspection the Oregon state seal is only good within the state of Oregon, so you can't take uh, Oregon inspected meat and transport it to uh, Washington and sell it because FSIS would be very unhappy to see that. Uh, so if that's the model that somebody's working for, we're more than happy to still bring them under state inspection. We'll we'll coach them, we'll tutor them, we'll walk them through all the red tape, we'll help them with whatever it is they need to need to be helped with. At the end of the path, we will you know help them put together a package and we'll hand it over to USDA, uh, and we'll be communicating with USDA through the whole process. And at you know once you've met our requirements, meeting their requirements is just filling out a new you know, document that says now you're under USDA inspection and you'll have met all of those requirements and it should be a very smooth, easy transition. Um, I say that we haven't done it yet, but we've talked about it a lot with USDA and they agree. Um, they, like everyone else, are concerned about uh, manpower, but 
from the logistical and red tape side that that should be a very seamless transition so that that's something that we're we're hoping to uh, at some point offer we've a couple of our um, facilities we've been working with especially in the hood river area because they're so the proximity is right on the border that that's something that they're interested in uh, doing at some point in the future uh, let's see uh, staffing and budget is the other thing that we're challenged with right now we're, we're looking at we've got two facilities under active inspection one is the slaughter facility that i mentioned and i'll go into more detail in the next slide uh, the other one is a, a prepared food product they're making taking essentially prepared charcuterie uh, slicing it packaging it and then selling it at local wineries and grocery stores and wherever folks charcuterie is very popular but because it's a meat product it has to be inspected under federal rules so we're providing that service as a state meat inspection program to give them that access to the market that is really what is driving their business um, we've got 11 more facilities that are we're working with <clears throat> uh, a chunk of which probably half of them are uh, processing facilities where they're getting in inspected meat and just doing further processing. Uh, and our our understanding is, and the model that's held true fairly well for us so far, is we need to have for each four facilities that are prepared foods, we need to have one inspector. Uh, so that that's kind of the ratio that we need, which is a little bit of a unique ask for us in food safety. Uh, I generally have one inspector for every 250 establishments, but that we don't require somebody to be on site all the time. So the meat program is one inspector for every four facilities that are processing. For slaughter, the ratio is one to one. So for every day that you're processing, we have or processing, we can be there for a quarter of the time and it meets the requirements. If you're slaughtering, we have to be there from before you start all the way through the slaughter process until you complete and go through the sanitation cycle. So that's that creates a one to one ratio for us. So that that's going to be a challenge that we are working to scale up our our program to meet those requirements. And right now our staffing is I have one specialist and I have a, a veterinarian that is uh, divided up between three actual veterinarians. I don't have a dedicated vet that does only the meat inspection. I've got three veterinarians that are one third of their time can be spent on meat inspection. So it gives me a little bit more geographic distribution. Uh, and then I'm working right now to convert a microbiologist position that was part of the original budget proposal that's part of my budget uh, over to be an inspector because that's really where I need the resources. And I have a, uh, a temporary assigned inspector that is covering the, the one slaughter facility we have and then uh, but with the growth, I, I'm eyeing the growth nervously. We've got six additional slaughter facilities that we're looking to add. Um, some of which are three months out, one of which is three months out, but they're pretty well staggered over the next year to 18 months. We'll be adding in the, the six additional facilities at the pace that we're looking at. So that means I would, over a two year period, need to be probably adding six more staff which that's a very, uh, there's some training and skill sets involved there that are fairly unique. And we've been fortunate so far that we've found, found some folks that came to us from USDA that were happy to um, transition over to us uh, in the, out of quasi retirement. Uh, but I, that's, I need to start looking organically at how I can grow those, but I also need to uh, iron out some some budget issues to make sure that that becomes those resources become available. Uh, Carla, next slide. So this is uh, a picture of my one temporarily assigned uh, meat inspector. Um, so that's Bob in the the meeting place is the name of the facility that is doing the slaughter that's up in the Forest Grove Hillsboro area. So that is a picture of him within the facility. It's it's a modified mobile facility. Uh, the the mobile facility has to operate out of a fixed space that has all of the, the physical requirements to maintain the human humane handling requirements for the cattle. Um, and then they do the slaughter and they do the processing to the halves. So you've got a, a hanging carcass there that's got 
uh, it'll have that stamp on it. And then they transfer that stamped carcass to their retail facility where they do the, the cut and wrap, uh, currently not under inspection. But because the carcass is inspected, they can transfer it to the other facility. They do the cut and wrap, and then they can sell it directly at retail. Um, the next kind of evolution of that process would be for the a facility like the meeting place could come under inspection for the cut and wrap, and then they would be able to distribute that meat further. But that's the, the purpose of having that, that uh, state meat inspection program is enables that access to extended markets and, you know, enabling further processing like uh, Jess was talking about earlier, that value added processing, the smoking, the, the drying, the, uh, you know, making the charcuterie, those are all, you know, high margin, high value, uh, you know, year round kind of propositions. Slaughter's a little bit seasonal and, you know, it spikes and it, it drops. So it, it's hard. That's been the, the challenge. Uh, morale was one issue, but also having year round employment is the other. Uh, it's a seasonal business, and we're hoping that through the inspection, enabling expanded uh, distribution, that markets like this will be able to become more year-round stable and retain their employees year-round. And those are those are expensive skills for people to learn. Um, but the meeting place, as our first inspected slaughter facility, it's been very exciting to see. Um, it's farm to fork within 14 miles which is mind boggling from the, the meat industry. If, and some of the charts Jess was showing earlier, it's 200 mile trips that were pretty common and probably a lot more than that. Uh, but, and it's been, as far as a proof of concept, it's been a huge success uh, from the standpoint of the industry um, and from us as well, but that, you know, we're not the target audience. It's really the industry. And from that success and and that firm's willingness to be very open and share, uh, we've actually been seeing more and more interest. So it's exciting, a little scary, because more interest means more people wanted to come under it, which means more uh, need of resources from from our standpoint. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see what this session brings if there's additional funding, because uh, I think that $14 million ask that came from that first round of funding uh, I could easily see that growing more if there were to be a second round of funding that were to appear. Uh, I don't think it'll stop at 14 million. It's it's going to be interesting to see, but I'm really hoping that we can see more interest coming from the east side of the state and finding a way to you know replicate the success we're seeing at the meeting place on a statewide basis. So happy to take any questions. And just Paulson, for the record, there was one other element to the, the process products that I forgot to touch on, which is uh, it's easy, I think, for us to imagine pepperonis and sausages and <clears throat> processed products, smoked meats and whatnot, like charcuterie. Uh, what you might not think about is a meat filled dumpling that also needs to be certified. And some of the producers that we have in the state are already producing a dumpling that is a vegetarian option because they don't have that certification. And so this will be a step two, especially those that are developing new products who have to steer or had to steer away from having anything meat in them because they just weren't at the point where they could get that certified. They now will have an option to do that earlier on and then build their product line going up. So there's there's a, a broad uh, value add that I don't think any of us have really put our minds around to, to get a good picture of what what all those products are and how much that'll bring back to the state. Here's that, Maria. Uh, Elon Miller, for the record. Um, I just wanted to mention um, I serve on the Community Cancer Board with the owner of Crystal Creek, and they were very sorry for not being able to be here today, but they are absolutely thrilled. And the, the thing they're most thrilled about with the holding pens is during the fair, and we have a, a, a lamb show each year, and I can't remember how many animals, but it keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, it, that is when the peak time for the 4-H and FFA kids to be able to get that process completed. And so anyway, I just wanted to say, you know, that they 
we're absolutely thrilled working with ODA on it and uh, just hope that others can benefit from this program as well. Yes, I'm going to ask our members joining us remotely. Do you have questions? Okay, both of you. Okay, I'm going to, Eric, you want to go first and then Barra? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Eric Arm, for the record. Uh, thank you, Jess and Rusty. Um, I just had a quick comment and then a question. Um, comment being, you're right, we, we, about six months ago, we started in the direct marketing of beef uh, from our farm, and we travel 160 miles one way to get it processed for a USDA inspection. We actually have to go out of state. Um, the east side is pretty desolate when it comes to, we have custom, custom slaughter facilities that we use, but we don't have the inspected plants um, or anything close. Um, my question would be, so so since we've started, of course, we we try to follow and model and watch the pricing of other direct farm to table uh, type ranches that are selling direct. And what we're finding is there are, I guess a, there must be a gray area in between, or maybe there isn't of just like people that sell hamburger. I, is there any cuts that are that people can sell that are not don't have to be usda inspected i guess i should say my understanding was everything retail if you're not going to a custom cutter and buying a quarter half or whole that it has to be inspected am i right in thinking that uh, rusty rock for the record yes you're correct everything that comes from amenable species must be inspected that's uh, from the hamburger up to any of the the fancy uh, prime cuts or any part of the animal even the the uh, you know the the tongue the liver the heart any of that if it's something that's going to be harvested and served for human consumption it has to have been from an animal that was slaughtered under inspection uh, the only out to that might be in the area of uh, non-amenable species. So bison are non-amenable and aren't required to come under uh, federal inspection. So there's not federal law regarding that, but state law says that uh, food products have to come from, or meat products have to come from an inspected source. So our state law says that there needs to be inspection of some sort. And at this point prior to the state meat inspection program, the only option was federal inspection for that uh, because inspection requires there to be uh, uh, pre and post uh, anti and post mortem inspection and uh, the custom shops don't have that capability. So a custom processed animal should not be something that's sold. Uh, and that is kind of the ancillary side effect of our state meat inspection program is we do uh, under federal requirements have to shore up some of our uh, enforcement action and investigation related to uh, meat products that are being sold uh, potentially illegally. And so we are we don't have a ton of resources in that area, but that is something that we're looking at. How do we shore that up and find the folks that are, maybe are under that misconception of uh, that they can sell their custom processed uh, hamburger because somebody told them it was okay uh, we want to work with them to get that information out. So I appreciate you bringing that question to the front. And if I may just pause the record, the, I think you touched on a, a part that we have been talking about with our industry group, and that's the um, full utilization of the animal. There, Everyone thinks uh, steak cuts and hamburger, but there are organs, and some of those are in higher demand among certain cultural foods than there are in others. So trying to figure out what those demands are, how we move those products to where people have demand for them um, and what other uses for them there, there might be is something that we've talked about the need for within our industry group um, for, for quite a long time, haven't found answers for yet, but are kind of caught in this chicken and the egg part of, uh, can we really talk about it when we don't have product on hand um, or can we talk about it, but we not really find solutions until after it's, it's available. So. 
Uh, certainly, we don't want to have the product coming on hand and not have a solution for it, but we're trying to thread that needle as we make progress. And then Barbara has a question. Yes. Please, Barbara, can you go ahead with your question? <laughs> yes, good morning. Barbara Boyer for the record. I love this program. I'm so excited to get this presentation today. Um, so I have so many questions, but I'll try to keep them very narrow. So, you know, you know, standing up this program does create other issues, and you brought it up about the rendering. So I'm curious where, what, what your thought process is for rendering when this really ramps up. So, Rusty Rock, for the record, uh, that that's something that we are spending a lot of time and energy trying to uh, put on the forefront. Uh, I know there was a bill that was in the legislative session that talked about uh, putting some money out there from the state to figure out some way to resolve that. Uh, the, the meeting place has showed us a different avenue that's not rendering, the uh, using of composting, uh, and it's a pretty short process, and it's a pretty... Um, sanitary process in my mind. I've, I've seen some pictures of it. It's pretty impressive. Uh, technology's come a long ways. Rendering, I think, is uh, as a as an industry has kind of become a, a secondary route uh, and that there's not the money in it. It's too much uh, energy input uh, is my understanding. Uh, and it's a fairly messy process, but some of these newer uh, rapid method composting and uh, you know trying to find even value added. I mean, composting is value added, but uh, I know Jess's team. I don't want to steal your thunder on the the hides. Um, I'll let him talk about that. Uh, have been looking for higher end value adds that are options because hides used to be something people sold and now uh, there's something that people don't even want to take and transport to landfills so uh, it's a changing uh, changing world and we're trying to figure out what the best routes are but to me composting has been a really exciting thing to watch and uh, but it's you know it really has to be something that's driven by industry and what folks want to do we can't force people to what path, tell them what path they have to follow. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of people just digging holes in their backyard and that that's not a sustainable model. The more we're doing that, we, we need to find good ways and provide options to folks. And Jess Paulson, for the record, it's um, compost and digesters are, are two that we've been talking about within our industry group. And one of the members of our team who's kind of been heading up that conversation has gone so far as to reach out to some people we know in Japan to see at their scale, what types of, um, not the approach of the digesters, but how the equipment and the scale is, is addressed so that it is sustainable. Um, so those, the resources for a, a rendering plant sometimes are being addressed through programs through USDA. They've had some similar programs over the last two years that have looked to do much of what we're doing. Unfortunately, a lot of those resources have been on timelines that don't really fit where we are or have requirements that aren't what we're trying to achieve. Um, but rendering, I think, will be really difficult within the state given just how far spread most of our business is and the cost of transporting to a, a single rendering plant and the need for it to be of a size to be viable that probably doesn't fit within the state. But yes, compost and, and if the digesters are something that can work um, one way or the other, we will really need that to turn from a cost to the operations, from a cost to a a new source of revenue, whether it's something that's coming out of the digest or out of, out of the composter that they can sell or uh, the digesters generating power, for example, that can be a new revenue stream. All right, thank you. Um, and then, so you six six of them were awardees. How many applications received altogether? Hmm. If you want to go on to another, sorry, Jess Balsam, for the record, if you want to go on to another question, if you have okay. one, I can pull that up here and get that answer right. pretty quick. Just curious. And, and then, um, so I have two more, and they're going to be quick, I promise. What is your ask in the pop? I'm sorry, I didn't look it up. 
just Paulson for the record. We had asked for, I think it was $10 million for the next biennium to do a similar uh, type of grant program. Okay. And will you, will you put admin fee in this particular round? <laughs> Uh, Lauren Henderson, acting director. Um, we're, if well, that money today is is uh, not coming to us. It, it wasn't included or hasn't been. But that that doesn't mean um, that we won't get some future ones. We're, we're, uh, admin fee is a little bit um, misleading. We're we're going to have to put in agency infrastructure staffing costs in in the next efforts. We we figured out a way to eat our costs internally on this last round. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. Rusty, as you've heard, the, the, the more we get on the ground, the more we're going to need staffing. And so uh, I've made a commitment to make sure that uh, we don't let that be a hindrance to getting this off the ground. But yeah, we're, we're going to have to have some pretty transparent conversations about this so we can keep going. Yeah. Is it is it going to disappear and just agency overhead and be no? Um, I, we'll have to cover some of those costs because there's some legal fees that go with that as well. But we we have to get people on the ground doing the inspections, or we've really failed on one part of this. Okay, great. Thank just, you. Just Paulson, for the record, to go back to your previous question, uh, we had 44 applications. Of those applications, it was requesting 14 million in. Uh, grant money request for a total of thirty-seven and a half million dollars in projects because each of those applications had uh, cash match and in-kind match that they were bringing for the total of the project. Thank you. That's a lot of applicants. I'm impressed. Uh, and then in closing, my last one is just a comment is I love the meeting place. So this is really exciting for me, for them. I have a, I buy a lamb every year and they process it for me, but then I happen to go into their retail store and boy, do I drop a lot of money in there because their stuff looks so good. <laughs> so I'm very excited for the meeting place and, and to watch the process. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah, so uh, Lauren Henderson and, and I, I can't resist having two minutes here and then I know we're late for public comment. So just uh, public comment, ha hang on, we'll, we'll get to you and make time. Um, this, 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 well, you all know how I feel about this program. Um, th this is a great example, I think, and, and a message for this board and why it's important for you to hear this. This is a really good example of why ODA needs to be cross collaborative. You have our marketing program and our food safety program or policy areas right in front of you. It also involved our natural resource program on the, the environmental considerations. And it really is an attempt to look, work across our programs, think strategically, not do something in one place that allows, Barbara, what you just brought up on the rendering part. We can't we can't put out grants and we can't put out infrastructure and have not through that. We can't improve this program and then have no markets for it. We can't, you know, and I can keep going on. And so we really tried to, with a good effort of a lot of people in our staff and the in the industries as whole, put this together in a way that is a very holistic approach and sustainable. And that's my job now going forward is it's it's now built. Um, and you've heard my analogies about that as to how do we make this sustainable so it's not just a thing and then it, it comes and goes. And I think where the board can can help with that is to to keep talking to be, people about there's very few dead ends in agriculture, in my opinion. Um, you just have to be willing to stick with it. And if it's not if it's not this, it, it could be production in another place or another uh, way regarding climate or those things. And just an encouragement to folks to say, you know, that it doesn't always have to end with too many regulations or too many this. It, it is a test for our department to continue to be collaborative with our other agency partners um, at all levels on the economic side, the natural resource side. The, the particularly around food safety and what we're trying to do there, because the benefit is what you're seeing here. Um, and we're got to keep at it and I'm going to keep at it. Um, I know our staff are um, uh, a little, they're not quite as excited as I am because I'm running them ragged because they're exhausted and tired, uh, but it's worth it. This is going to be one of those things that I think people can look back on and say, I'm glad we did this. And for, for me, it's about improving the map so Eric doesn't have to drive 160 miles 
one way one of these days and maybe that will happen but we all benefit from that so thank you chair okay very good good discussion but we need to continue we have our agenda here uh we're going to um, do our next item is a public comment we have one request um to join us remotely so carla Oh, okay. Can I go? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I would like to call Dennis uh, Shihai. Uh, he wants to talk about the resolution, the Cougar Management Plan. All right. Hello? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Dennis Shihai. I'm a rancher in Wallow County. And I'm also the Wildlife Chair, Committee Chair for the Oregon Cattlemen Association. Uh, Oregon Cattlemen Association is a primary representative for livestock produce in Oregon, with members in most of Oregon counties. The Oregon Cattlemen Association and its members recognize the need for wildlife management as we are often directly affected by wildlife depredation. And the Oregon Cattlemen Association supports, fully supports the Oregon State Board of Agriculture resolution to support Oregon's 2017 Cougar Management Plan. Uh, the Oregon Cattlemen Association does have one concern for future uh, resolutions in that in chapter three of the management plan, or the ODF and W states what they will do relative to cougar livestock interactions based on a sustainable 3,000 uh, cougar population in the state. There's a lot of things happening that might change that population number, even decrease it, including wolf cougar interactions, uh, loss of habitat. So it's possible that in the future, the 3,000 limit for sustainable population may not be appropriate. In that case, the ODFW has stated in that uh, management objective would not necessarily have to proactively manage the livestock cougar interaction. So I'm just suggesting that that might be an issue that needs to be addressed in rising the next resolution. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony uh, concerning the resolution by Board of Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And I think we just have that one, right, Carla? Okay. So we are going to take a break. I uh, think um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes now. So we will come back at 11.10. So let's take a break. Thank you.
George, hi George, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's talking to him. <laughs> Somebody's talking to me. No. <laughs> are you ready? No, he doesn't listen to me. Can you hear me, Josh? Hello. Ah, yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Are you, are you talking to me? <laughs> yes, it's you. It's you. I wanted to to touch okay. base with Sorry, you. I didn't hear the name. I just heard, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> you think you were dreaming? No, it's me. You know, uh, we're gonna do the resolutions first. Uh, uh, for our board um, business, and yeah, because Elena is to go uh, to leave earlier, so we wanna be sure that she's here. <laughs> so okay. uh, we will do that first. So just wanna let you know that we to be aware, because okay. I think we need to vote in what, which ones we need to vote. So I have oh, we have to vote four of them. Oh, seven. So what I have to do when we, thank you, Josh. I will. Uh, let you know. <laughs> Just okay. wanted to let you know that be aware that we're gonna go first with our resolutions. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. So Just let me know when I can't really tell when everyone's kind of ready to go. Josh is coming for us and then he'll say, you know, this is ready to, for the full board for approval. And then um, what I have to say. Over on the side, they have, uh, He's going to say that. He's going to say that. the work group recommends that this and that 000 is we recommend for approval with the proposed edits. And then uh, you'll ask for a motion. Oh, like the Right, like the minutes. Yep. You'll ask for a motion. They already hide that part. I don't need to read that again. Yeah, you'll have to do it every time. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that. I have been super organized today. I was going bad that I, I cannot leave my phone with my charger. Oh, there you go. This one. No. One more. Oh, nice. Okay. One more. Okay. So, do I have a motion to approve resolution 000? zero zero zero? Yeah. I don't know when they connected to me, but
Hey, um, Carla, or anyone in the boardroom, can you guys hear me? I, I can no longer hear anything. Okay. Well, Josh, I'm not in the boardroom, but I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations on your son's graduation. <laughs> I hope it was a good commencement. <laughs> I can hear you too, Josh. Oh, I thought it was Eric talking. Sorry. No, oh, no, that's all right. Your son. Thanks. It was a good, yeah, it was good graduation yesterday afternoon. It was nice. Josh, that was me, Jim Johnson. So. Hey, Jim. How you doing? Oh, oh, money. Money. <laughs> He's giving money away. Oh, yeah. oh, my gosh. Oh, sorry, I usually give it to the first person I see. <laughs> and now you have some preference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 it's Okay, we are going to continue with our meeting for this morning and the next item in our agenda, um, Luisa Santa Maria for the record, sorry, I always tell that don't forget your name and I forgot. Um, uh, we're going to continue with our board business and we're going to go with the um, resolutions for the workshops because Eileen has to leave earlier today so we're gonna go that because we need his boat her boat no, sorry um so let's go with the resolutions for the group a and please um, i know george is going to do the report for group a are you ready george yeah, yeah. Um, what is that, can guys, Judge? Can you guys hear? Okay, now it's quiet. There was like music and stuff. I feel like I had to yell. But um, Group A, uh, Worker A, consisted of Chad Allen, um, Miguel Lopez, I don't think was uh, present, um, and Eric was. Uh, there um, virtually, I think. Uh, Luisa and myself, um, Isaac chimed in, um, even though it was his birthday, uh, he was there for a bit, and Chris and Jeff Paulson were also there. Uh, we I thought we had a pretty straightforward set of resolutions. Um, there was no public comments or anything on any of them that I can that I recall. Uh, Maybe there's one on the cougar management from uh, um, the Oregon Hunting Association. Um, you can find that in, in the notes. Uh, but basically, we looked at uh, resolution 000, which um, <clears throat> addresses how the board policy and procedures for resolutions. We recommend moving item 000 forward for board approval with the proposed edits, which you already had going into yesterday. We made no further edits. Um, do you want me to just keep going through all these or do we have to make a motion and do all that each time? Huh? Yes, we're going to um, vote uh, after each of the resolutions. OK, so I'm going to okay. ask, I'm going to ask, uh, do I have a motion to approve the resolution 000? So moved. OK, Lynn Miller for the record. Thank you. Mm. Brian Harper, second. Second. It's moved and seconded to approve the resolution number 000. So, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 So, do we have a. Uh, 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 yes, I forgot. Is all some opposed say no? No, we don't have. Okay. So, based on the outcome, we're going to move forward to the full board. For approval, oh, don't we already approved? <laughs> we already approved. So we're going to approve the resolution number zero zero zero. Okay, next resolution, please, Josh. The next resolution for work group A uh, is <clears throat> resolution number zero two nine, 
uh, which has to do with the reservation of Columbia River water for irrigation purposes. Um, we also recommend moving uh, resolution 029 forward for the board's uh, approval. Um, if you will recall, this, this resolution basically stuck in, in litigation. Uh, there's not really any, hasn't been any changes to anything um, in recent times concerning this resolution. So uh, we kind of say that it should just stay the way it is. And again, um, we recommend moving it forward for the board's approval today. Okay. Thank you. So, well, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of resolution 029? Motion to approve, Eric Warren. Okay. Second, Brian Harper. Thank you. So, it's moved and seconded to approve the resolution 029. Um, all of those uh, in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed say no. We don't have no's. So based on the outcome of the vote, uh, we're going to um, approve the resolution 0 to 9. Okay. Thank you. Next, please, George. The next resolution uh, that we, <coughs> that work group A considered uh, is the <coughs> resolution number 124 uh, that has to do with um, trade policy and promoting free and reciprocal access. Um, we also recommend moving um, this uh, resolution 124 forward to the board's approval. Okay, we didn't have any change in that one. Uh, do I have a motion to approve resolution 124? We don't have a motion. Do we have a motion? So moved, Brian Harper. Sorry. Um, second. second. Thank you. It's moved and seconded to approve the resolution 124. Uh, all of those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No no's. So, based on the outcome of the vote, uh, we will approve resolution 124. Please, next, uh, George. The, the fourth item, uh, the fourth resolution that work group A uh, was tasked with um, looking at was the uh, resolution 269, uh, which states basically that the Board of Agriculture supports development of biofuels in Oregon. Uh, on this particular resolution, um, there was some question as to whether it's relevant or if it needs to be kind of updated. Um, we didn't really have any good information uh, current you know, stakeholders uh, or people who are maybe receiving some of the benefits from this resolution or, um, that were part of the support component of this. Uh, so we suggested maybe um, our recommendation is to hold this uh, resolution for further review and comments. Um, we would like to have a presentation by the ODA, possibly um, depart, uh, the EQ, um, to gather some additional background on this matter just to see, you know, um, you know if, if we need to make any changes on the resolution based on some further education. So I guess our recommendation is to hold uh, for further review and comments, uh, resolution 269. I don't know if you, do you need a motion to hold something? No, no, not really. So the resolution 269 will be for recommendation. It's about the uh, agriculture support development of biofuels in Oregon. So that will be recommended. 
for review. For the review. All right, so please, Judge, you are in charge. Next. Um, the second to the last resolution uh, that work group A took a look at um, was the resolution 275, the Cougar Management Plan. Uh, there was some written public comment, and I think you heard from a gentleman today uh, uh, with some um, uh, oral comment, uh, both very similar and, uh, in that they were supporting our stance. Um, so with that, we recommend moving resolution 275 forward to the board for approval as it, as it is. Elon Miller, so moved. Second, Brian Harper. Thank you. So it's moved and seconded to approve resolution 275. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. So based on the double count of the vote, we are going to approve resolution mm, numbers 275. All right, I think we have one more resolution, Judge. The last resolution that work group A looked at was uh, the Native Plant Conservation Program. Um, resolution 305. Uh, our work group came up with some additional edits, uh, primarily concerning um, the background portion, no edits to the actual resolution, but a couple of the whereas um, comments were expanded a little bit to kind of um, uh, just give a, a, broad, a more specific uh, definition. It, it's kind of, it's a very short resolution and um, it was just a little bit, a little bit of expansion um, that the uh, Director Chris Brennan uh, brought to us, and, and we thought that they were good. But um, it's, it's work. so our work group uh, has some additional edits to the background statement, and we'll post those edits for public comment. And maybe that um, once you guys have a chance to look at it, we can all um, approve that at a later date. All right. Lisa Santa Maria for the record. Uh, thank you, Josh. I think you did a very good job with all the resolutions. So we're going to continue with the group B. All right, Elon Miller for the record. Um, um, our work group met last night, uh, Boyer Harper Miller with support from Jim Johnson, Rusty Rock and Jonathan Sandow. Um, and first is resolution 155. Our recommendation is to move resolution 155 forward for approval by the board. All right, thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve resolution 155? So moved, Brian Harper. Second, Chad Allen. Okay, thank you. It's moved and seconded to approve resolution 155. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. So based on the outcome of the vote, uh, we will approve resolution 155. The next resolution, uh, buildable lands inside urban growth boundaries, resolution 162, uh, recommended um, moving forward on 162 with the edits that were out for public comments. So as was presented to the public. All right. And I'll just go ahead and move to approve. Okay. So a motion for approve. was yours. Somebody wants to second? Second. Second. Right Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, it's moved and seconded to approve resolution 162. Um, all of those that in favor, say aye. 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 All those op opposed, say no. No opposed. Okay, based on the outcome of the vote, we will approve resolution 162. 
All right, the next resolution, um, protection of Oregon agriculture, resolution 295. We wanna hold this for further review and comments by the public. We have su uh, suggested, and it's going back to um, the, the team at ODA, some additional uh, changes. We'd like to um, add the Oregon uh, Ag Heritage Program in uh, bullet number three of the resolution. And also in light of a lot of the legislation going through and just the, the state of what's going on in our state in uh, number eight, uh, support the development of a state strategic plan uh, that integrates um, land use, transportation and economic development priorities. We wanna add water supply to that and so that's going back and so it'll go back out for public comment and we'll take it up at the next meeting. Um, resolution 300, um, we received no comments on and again, um, what we recommend moving forward on 300 for full board approval. So do I have a motion to approve resolution 300? So moved, Brian Harper. Second, Chad Allen. Okay. Um, uh, it's moved and seconded to approve the resolution 300. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No, no. So based on the outcome of the vote, we will approve resolution 300. Okay, the, the last resolution um, that our work group worked on uh, was sitting, um, citing of agritourism, entertainment activities and associated activities on ag lands, other than maybe the title we need to think about changing. Uh, we'll be brainstorming that. We're gonna hold for further review and comments. Um, and we as a uh, work group had proposed some edits. I'll just highlight those really quickly. Um, proposed edits under the resolution two B, um, in light of case law to add um, incidental and before subordinate uh, based upon case law um, that has occurred. So that's under 2B um, in that first line. We also um, are because there was some confusion of the coverage of this. Um, we up in the whereas section, we're um, going to ask uh, the team to add a whereas clause uh, regarding wineries that they are not, they are covered basically under separate law that was passed, I think in 2013. So let's just, you know, qualify that. And that also was driven by um, under number three, we wanted to um, substitute winery that's listed in that for home occupation um, for dealing better definitions of these things. And then finally, under bullet number five, um, we, well, where stakeholders use, we want to use some other term other than st stakeholder, given our past director's interest in having that, a different name, whether it be community parties or whomever, but we'll work on that too. So those changes are going back to the team for review. Um, and then because of, we received a lot of comments at the very end, actually after the deadline, and some of us just looked up to the deadline timeframe of what was in the file. Um, so uh, we want, we will probably have a special workshop, which we will definitely notice and be available for public um, uh, um, participation and, and reviewing and listening to that workshop between now and our uh, board meeting in Tillamook. So nothing to move on that right now, but we're work in progress. And if Brian or Barbara have anything more to add. Oh, I think you pretty well covered it, Brian Harper for the record. Okay, thank you, Brian. All right, thank you, that's it. Thank you, uh, Lisa Santamaria, for the record. So I think we have a review our resolutions for uh, our Workshop. So I think we're going to go to the next uh, um, step in our business, um, in our board business. So um, I'm going to go with the, about the ODA program area reports. I would like to know if we, uh, any of the members of the board have any questions <coughs> for the ODA staff. But, uh, maybe Lauren will be the person to respond. Is there any question? Do you have any question? Okay. 
now. Our board members from remotely, Josh, Eric, no. Barbara, no. Okay. I think we don't have questions for the report. Um, Chair Santa Maria, I did forget this. Ela Miller, for the record, I did forget in the resolution discussion. One of the things is we did want to have a comprehensive download on the subject, and I think we had anticipated we'd have it here, but because of leave issues, we didn't have it at this meeting. But we'll need to have that in the Tillamook meeting before we would finalize um, 310. Oh, okay. So something to add for the yeah. resolution. Okay. Yeah. So. Jim Johnson just jumped on. Oh, Jim Johnson? Yeah. Hello, yeah, Jim. everyone. Oh, Jim. Hello, everyone. Okay. Jim Johnson, uh, Land Use and Water Plan Corner. I just wanted to back up what what Elon just said here. What we're what we're looking at is any draft language that's developed between uh, now and the and the Tillamook meeting. The, the, the subcommittee will 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 get together and discuss that. That will be separate from a presentation that I will try that I will be developing for Tillamook for the whole board that will discuss um, all the different elements in land use that relate to agritourism. So that, that's kind of what the plan is long term. Thank yeah, thank you, Jim. And and what we talked about too, in light of all the comments and like in light of our learning at the Tillamook meeting of some of the subject matter, we may end up holding over again or we may be able to go forward with the re resolution in Tillamook. But we have we have to the end of the year. And I think as we've learned over these years that uh, we um, also can bring up a resolution at any time if we feel it needs to be brought up or and rediscuss or um, actually come up with a new resolution um, as discussed. So I think sometimes uh, the public is a little confused with our resolution process. So, so as we communicate, I know we have, but we can communicate more so thanks. and i would just add too that we always have to remind ourselves that while we're reviewing these resolutions the resolution as it currently stands is active so um even this could be stretched out for months but the current resolution is active and i'll just one more and this resolution has been pla in place since uh, basically um 2012 so there's you know again it's reviewing these every few years that a lot of stakeholders may not real or community members may not realize right well i don't know about the public uh, comments but there were more than 20 so if something is going on we need to help to clarify this thank you jim to join us uh so we will continue with our meeting agenda. And um, the next thing is um, we need to nominate uh, a, co a nominating committee. And as uh, chair, I have asked um, Brian Harper and Barbara Boyer to be part of these, to serve on a nominating committee uh, for the next chair and vice chair of the board. So we will meet and report back at uh, the August meeting our decision or our, um, our next uh, point is um, the OGWEB report. So board member Barbara Boyer is online and will provide us uh, with some update. Barbara? Actually, I think Barbara's jumped off the huh? call. He's not here? No. Oh, he's gone. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> we didn't know. Uh, so we don't have a, a web report today. And I think the next thing we need to cover today is the, if we can provide some topics for the newsletter. That is what we have in our agenda. We usually have some ideas. What would you like to see in the newsletter as a result of our meeting today? This here. Um, yeah. Any idea what you'd like to have <laughs> in the newsletter? Elon Miller, for the record, um, I think that uh, how our grants are being utilized, and I think very well, especially the last presentation yesterday, was 
I thought pretty inspiring. And I think just the thematic of, you know, the money is being utilized and, and spread throughout the state and the community and that, I mean, that kind of thematic deal, as well as obviously the new meat initiative is a big deal. And we definitely are wanting to, to look at expansion there. So. That would be a good uh, some other idea for the newsletter. And the board, Josh, Eric, no? I think uh, just highlighting the fact that we visited the Umqua area. Um, I don't know the last time the board was here. Certainly my first time, um, and maybe, you know, feature some of the people that we heard from on our tours yesterday. Um, I don't know if you want to go into a lot of detail, but we heard some concerns about labor, um, which resonate with a lot of us, but I don't know how in depth you want to go on the newsletter. <laughs> This is uh, Acting Director Henderson. You know, one, one of the things, I don't know if it was planned necessarily or not yesterday, that I thought to add what Josh said, that I think it would be good for the board to put in a newsletter, is we saw uh, basically three very different families yesterday um, and, and what they had done. But the common thing really among all of them was succession. Yes. And, and they're thinking ahead about um, their succession. They They're all three of them doing it a little bit differently, but I, I think that's an important piece. Um, you've heard me worry about that, but we saw that yesterday in three very different forms. So I don't know if that's an interest to the board and, and how different that was, but it all kind of ended in the same thing, which is um, we still have um, agriculture in all three of those places. Well, Lisa Santa Maria for the record. I will add like um what we can find in this area, the diversity that we have, and also maybe include something about the succession. But I think we were able to see three different um, uh, production systems, and I was impressed with the blueberry production. It, I was not aware, so that could be really interesting to have. Um, yeah, so I think diversity in just a small location that not many people know about in the details. Well, something we can highlight that the places we visit. Well, Brian Harper here. I guess another common theme that was spoken about was labor, and yeah. uh, it was pretty well aggressively made clear yeah. uh, that it was a, probably the biggest concern, and uh, I think that that's worth highlighting. Elon Miller, for the record, and I'll just add on the labor too um, that you know, as as some had predicted um, with the changes that have occurred in the legislation, that instead of resulting in overtime necessarily being paid, it has resulted in making sure you just get to whatever that cap is as it goes down, and then have to go to other other employer employees other labor to be able to fill that additional gap and and uh, and I'm not sure people fully understood or realized that implication so I know this is not something that the Oregon Department of Ag hasn't necessarily taken positions on but we may at some point in time want to look at getting kind of updates on what's been happening out there in regards to the labor situation so Another thing that we could add is maybe just thank um, our wonderful hosts for dinner last night. Yeah. They even had nice weather for us. Yeah, we're going to go to the newsletter. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Luisa Santa Maria, for the record, I think we have completed our board business. Um, and we are going to some notes for for lunch. Adjourn. <laughs> Adjourn. Yeah, I didn't find. I don't find my notes. Yeah, I think I we're done, right? Mm -hmm. We're done. <laughs>
I don't have my notes here. <laughs> I want to keep you. talking, right? <laughs> very good. Thank you very much for joining us today. And yeah, that is uh, the end of our visit. Um, um, cool. <laughs> Thank you for welcoming us.